at a time when postmodernism was, because I was trained through the 1980s, mm -hmm. in these different three worlds, right. uh, had become both a series of debates on the ethics and uh, substantive questions of, of writing in the social sciences and humanities, but also a label and a name and an insult and an anxiety over the future of the academy and seriousness mm -hmm. and who got to be an academic and racialization in the academy and postmodernism was made to do a lot of critical work. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people very anxious about the future, a lot of, and, and, and I kind of, when I came out of graduate school, a bunch of people said, we want to publish your book. It's a classic postmodernist text of the new anthropology. And I said, really? Once again, and I wasn't being faux naive, but the, in part, because I spent so long in medical school, one version of the story is that I know from postmodernism. I, I, what I knew was several things. I was trained in an earlier moment of anthropology, then I'll try to answer the question more precisely, which was that you study everything. Mm -hmm. And you try to find a way to write about it, which is impossible. And that came out of a certain idea of culture and society, which turns out to be painful and no longer one we hold to, that it's simply holistic, mm -hmm. and that cultures like cages and the zoo can be separated in these kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. But that was part of the training, and it was also a certain kind of model of anthropology as colonial governance, in which you studied in the village and everything was relevant. And so what you did was to try to study everything and find a form of writing that would integrate it. Mm -hmm. And um, now no one told me that form of thinking had ended, because I was trained in a very old-fashioned program, which was Harvard, which was still very much of the old anthropology. Mm -hmm. And But it was clear to me that things had changed. People were watching movies. Mm -hmm. And I want to understand how the movies were important. So I watched movies, mm -hmm. began to think about them. Uh, TV was changing with privatization and new forms of capital. Mm -hmm. um, so I watched those texts, but I also was curious. And so I went to Bombay um, to meet the producers or to talk to people who wrote movie scripts. Mm -hmm. um, people were taking drugs. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to understand why these drugs were being marketed for certain effects at certain moments. So I went to the drug companies. I talked to the executives. I talked to the local drug detailers, people that were trying to sell them to doctors. I, I wrote letters to drug companies saying, I want to buy these drugs. And people came to see me to sell me these drugs. And I, at every level, and I didn't do all this because I, I try to be postmodern. That is, I have instead of one site, I'm working on everything, I'm working all over the place. The United Nations was trying to sort of change how India approached old age, which is what the book is about. Mm -hmm. So I went to talk to people at the UN. I did all this because I had this old-fashioned idea that you had to know everything relevant to your topic. But then the question was, how do you write about it? And, mm -hmm. and it was kind of crazy. And I think my response was just to try to... I didn't think I was doing anything funny. After I did it, people said, oh, this is a very unusual form of writing. Um, my advisors let me get away with it. A, because it's anthropology, so we're a funny discipline. Mm -hmm. It was anthropology at a certain moment when it was mm -hmm. questioning what kinds of writing should be used. Mm -hmm. um, it was anthropology at a moment which was part of the reflexive turn. Mm -hmm. The personal voice was mm -hmm. somehow accepted in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, I think also because I was writing on old people, mm -hmm. I could get away with a lot more. Later on I began to write about sexuality and I write about people I know and myself in terms of sexual questions or friendships. Then things get trickier off, awful fast. Not mm -hmm. that they should or shouldn't, but my relationship with someone, let's say she's 80 and I'm at that point 29, doesn't raise eyebrows as my sexual relation with someone else or my friendship with someone else. Um, and I'm not saying the second shouldn't, but the first should too. Mm. But we don't tend to problematize aging in the same kind of way. And it, it, so I think I got away with stuff in part because my topic was, for many readers, inherently depoliticized. People didn't see the politics mm. in the representation across generation. I did. Mm. And I tried to make them front and center, but many people who read it said, oh, this is nice. Mm. You know, I mean, it's, it's uh, old people how. And so I. I think I got away with stuff in part because of the topic and the inherent tendency of many to depoliticize generation cohort as sites of difference in politics. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I did do practically was that the difference in the dissertation and the book is the book had a lot more social theory 
Um, Judith Butler had just come on the scene. Uh, I mean, in part, I was changing. Uh, a, I was sort of discovering queer theory, ch transformations in feminism, both personally, you know, as a young queer person, but also as a scholar. Mm -hmm. you know, I had no feminist anything in graduate school. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was writing up my dissertation, someone came to Harvard, you know, under 300 years of age, and I shouldn't say that on. <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't go. But uh, someone came to Harvard, and um, and we read together. Um, and it was catching up. I mean, it was really catching up the classics of second wave, let alone so-called third wave feminism. And, but my mind was being blown, let alone on queer stuff. And I was reading Eve Sedgwick, and I was reading Judith Butler. And I was, oh my god, and this is all relevant to thinking about the body and thinking about you know, the politics of the body. Mm -hmm. So um, all of that had to be very top-loaded was stuck at the last minute into my dissertation. And my advisor rightly said to me, this is pyrotechnics, this is too much, where's the personal voice? Now, in part, it's because I hadn't digested it all. Mm -hmm. It was new, it was exciting, I wanted it in my dissertation. Mm -hmm. um, it was in the dissertation, I took out some, but I kept it, I, wouldn't, I fought back. But for the actual book, I mean, a lot of it's there, but more implicitly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, I allowed myself to move away from the burden of representing myself as a grand theorist. And the question was try to make the theory work in the forms of the text. But um, so that was one major shift to the dissertation. Um, and in part it happened because I wasn't fighting. But when I was fighting against my advisors to have Judith Butler in my text, uh, literally, I often did her and her work a disservice because I was new to it. Once I was here, in fact, this was now a colleague, these debates were much more central to my work. I could try to find a way to embody them in my thinking not necessarily in a series of arguments to show the world that I've read all these texts, but mm -hmm. just to sort of try to find a way to bring them into the text. And since um, I wasn't in this productively adversarial relation of being a graduate student, I didn't you know, feel I had to fight for certain texts. I could find a different way to incorporate them. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I did was I liked to think a bit creatively, and there's certain kinds of things I wanted in my book but they didn't quite fit within the chapters, mm -hmm. and I needed to finish it to uh, get it done mm -hmm. as part of being an academic. Mm -hmm. And so what I did when I was writing up the final draft is I gave myself these presents. It doesn't have to be for a book, it could be for a dissertation, which is I said after I finish a chapter in a way that I'm happy with, I get to have a little kind of entre-act, I get to have a little section between the chapters where I get to play a bit more. Mm -hmm. with some themes I'm wrestling with in a different kind of way in the chapter. Mm -hmm. And I get to take a series of moments that were important to me and a way to think about something that happened mm -hmm. and about, if you like, the um, what the um, anthropologist uh, Katie Stewart would call worlding. She gave a talk here a few days ago on this idea. Mm -hmm. And I get to think about different worldings, different ways in which uh, certain kinds of worlds come into being for certain periods of time. So one of these sections is on um, a conversation with a philosopher in a room, a quiet room in a busy Calcutta neighborhood while his mother, who I would define as someone trained to be an American physician as having dementia, mm -hmm. was sitting in the next room. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about her mm -hmm. as he was talking and there was traffic outside. And in part, I try to use this to think about questions in the other chapters, mm -hmm. but to also think about the politics of research, what I can and cannot ask about. I'm curious about your mother. I'm here to talk about philosophy, um, um, and so forth. And I try to use the text to address things the way that the chapters didn't. So in that part of the text, I had different kinds of text-making practices. Mm -hmm. But the final thing I guess I would say is that um, in that moment of anthropology, it seemed urgent that the personal voice be present so the reader would know simply what I was doing, more or less, as best I can honestly reproduce it, because I can't, and it's always in partial bad faith, what I was thinking, what I was, what kind, you know. And to give the reader certain materials for making sense of me. My colleagues at Kilgupta and Jim Ferguson differentiated the kind of question of positionality that is just locating yourself, I am this, mm -hmm. in India, 
I'm American, I'm white, I'm middle class, I'm, I'm someone in his 20s, not now, but then, mm -hmm. when I was doing the work, or 30s, when I was, you know, writing it up. Um, and, uh, and they said, what you're doing is location work. No one cares who you are, the question is what work you do with your situatedness mm -hmm. and the relations that that produces, the demands, the ethics. And so in part, I'm writing to try to experiment with um, what I can do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm writing to give the reader materials to make sense of me, rather than trying to fully to tell the reader, yes, this is my position, this is what I've done, so I get to once again be in command of the politics of who I am. Mm -hmm. Give the reader a bunch of material so the reader can think with, critique, um, hopefully. And so part of it was to, is to throw a bunch of things to the reader, um, some of which were very central to my argument, some of which were a bit peripheral. So the reader would have some other materials to think about what I was doing in ways that I often wasn't aware of. Mm -hmm. aware of. And, and um, that, that's. Uh, nowadays, that moment of the so called reflexive term is over. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that an anthropologist uh, should centrally be giving you a sense, or any scholar, of what he or she was doing, thinking of the relationship between the intellectual project and the author's own grandmothers, for example. Mm -hmm. I write in the book on my grandmothers, and in part the logic was if I'm going to exploit other people's grandmothers, I should start by exploiting my own. Mm -hmm. In part, I realized that what I think about old age is tied to these forms of experience, and not only words exchange, but the smell of one of my grandmother's homes whenever I went there, or uh, the different ways in which food mediated these very class-specific worlds of my more middle-class and my more working-class grandmother, mm -hmm. or the ways in which my own nostalgia as a certain kind of racialized subject, you know, that as a Jewish kid from Canada living in the U.S., worked through ideologies that I produced through grandmotherness or memory and so forth. And so I try to give the reader pieces of that to think about the trickiness of my efforts to think I know something about old age, mm -hmm. um, as well as to think myself about that, but to, in a way that's hopefully not too heavy-handed. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And nowadays my students don't feel the burden of that moment. In a sense, their burden, in part, is to deal with the limits of that moment, mm -hmm. the ways in which the reflexive both produces possibilities but also has its own possible violence, its own you know, insistent voice, and mm -hmm. the, um, um, so I, I wrestle with it in different kinds of ways, and uh, it, that's probably, those are my thoughts, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but when my, the student said to me at NYU, how do you get away with this, my simple answer was no one stopped me, and, and I think in part it's anthropology. I don't think it's sociology in most forms. In the U.S. I could have done that. Mm -hmm. uh, in India I'm trained as a sociologist. Um, but the sociology I was trained in there is quite different.